Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You've been there, haven't you? It says if you can believe, all things are possible. Well, good morning, beloved. It is an absolute delight to see you all here this morning and to uh, be able to open the Word of God together, to sing His praise, and to learn from His Word the things that are so important to our everyday lives. Open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 14 today, and this is kind of a follow-up from what we looked at last week. Last week we saw the transfiguration of Christ where Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up onto the mountain, probably the side of Mount Hermon, way up there in the northernmost part of, uh, of Israel, actually outside of the borders of Israel into Gentile territory. And there Jesus was transfigured. All of a sudden as he and the disciples were praying, the, the veil of His human flesh was lifted for just a moment and the very glory of God shone through. And uh, it, it was an amazing event for those disciples who were there with Jesus on the mountain. And He told them not to tell anybody else, but to wait until after He had risen from the dead. And we talked about the significance of that a little bit last week. Have you ever noticed that spiritual highs are always followed by valleys? Have you noticed that in life? There are times when we feel especially close to the Lord and there are times when we pick up the Word and the, the Bible just seems to come alive to us as we read it and we begin to think about other passages of Scripture that relate to what we're reading and and, and the Lord just sort of turns the light on a little bit and we see more clearly than we have at other times. But those kinds of times don't last forever, do they? We, we have to come back to the everyday, ordinary, humdrum stuff of life. And though we understand that God is involved in the humdrum and the ordinary, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said God must have loved the common man because he made so many of them that you know God is is here in the ordinary but we don't often see it for ourselves do we it just seems ordinary well the disciples are coming down off the mountain and they get right back into ordinary stuff of life the parallel passages that I encouraged you to read were in Matthew chapter 17 and Luke chapter 9. All three of those Gospels record this event right after the transfiguration there on the mountain. But it's only Luke who tells us that it was the next day. Matthew and Mark don't mention a time frame at all. They just end their account of the transfiguration on the mountain and in the very next sentence they open up with their account of what transpires here after Jesus and Peter, James and John have come down off the mountain. But Luke tells us it was the next day. And I think that's important because it was probably during that night that they spent there on the side of Mount Hermon, most likely around a campfire. I mean, how many of us have ever gone camping? We've spent the night out some night and we haven't had a campfire. Campfires are comforting to us. They keep us warm and so forth. So I'm, I'm just guessing that it was around a campfire that they had their conversation about Elijah and John the Baptist. And we looked at that last week. And we, we saw that uh, Elijah was sort of the pattern of that prophet who would come immediately before Jesus and would prepare the hearts of God's people. And that's what John the Baptist did. We also mentioned that it seems to be Elijah himself who will return and prepare the hearts of God's people just before the 
second coming of Jesus Christ, but you can check last week's sermon out and get all that information. Here, in the morning, after they've spent the night there on the mountain, Jesus, Peter, James, and John are coming down, walking their way down to the valley where they had left the other nine disciples. And these guys are engaged in some conversation, and I think it probably was a bit chaotic. Because there was there a man with his son who was demon-possessed. Now, beloved, I want to make sure that we understand that evil spiritual beings are real. They're not, uh, you know, stories of the boogeyman kind of thing, the, the ghosts and so forth that, that just are, are made up to scare people. No, there is that dimension of life unseen by us 99.9% .9 of the time that encompasses both those good angels, the righteous angels, that Hebrews 1.14 says are sent on behalf of those who love God. And there are those fallen angels, evil angels, some of whom actively seek to hinder God's plan and purpose, to terrorize humans, to thwart the efforts of God's people, we are, as Paul says in Ephesians, engaged in a spiritual conflict. Now, as we sit here this morning and look at each other, we don't see it, do we? We drove here, and, and you probably didn't see any um, angelic beings, good or evil, on your way. Maybe you got behind the guy that was going like 10 miles an hour and thought that he was a little demonic, but you know, you, 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 you survived that and, and you got here. But beloved, I want to assure you that there really is, going on in this world, a tremendous spiritual conflict. And you and I are engaged in that. We see it illustrated time and again just think with me about the examples we've already seen in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 1, verse 13, we have the account of Jesus there in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now, Satan is a real entity, a real being. And Jesus was engaged in interaction with him during that period of 40 days. And Satan's desire was to try to derail Jesus from his appointed mission, that of being the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, the one who would sacrifice himself, die on the cross, and rise again from the dead. Satan wanted to resist that. And so for a concentrated period of 40 days, Jesus is there in the wilderness communing with his heavenly Father, dealing with the attacks, the temptations, the efforts of Satan to get him off of God's pre-appointed path. We see it also there in Mark chapter 1. Verse 23, a little bit later, when Jesus casts a demon out of a man in the synagogue. Right there in the synagogue where the Word of God is supposed to be proclaimed, where the, the rabbi is to be teaching the Word of God, there was a man there that day, and I'm sure it wasn't the first day that he was there, who was in reality demon-possessed. And when Jesus spoke, that demon responded and Jesus dealt with him by casting that demon out of the man. It was very real. People were there. They saw it. They were amazed. They thought, what kind of teaching is this? Even the demons obey him. It was amazing to them. Mark chapter 1, verse 34. Just, and it's so easy to pass it by. It was later, apparently, that night and, and people were coming and they were being healed and it says that Jesus healed many and cast out many demons. So the guy in the synagogue that morning wasn't the only one who was delivered from demonic possession. There were others 
at that same time. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Jesus is traveling about. He's teaching, going around the area of Galilee. He's healing people. And unclean spirits recognize him. And he casts them out. They identified him. We know who you are, Jesus, the Son of God. There's a real spiritual battle that is taking place in this world. Mark chapter 5. This was the account of the two fellows, as we read in the, the parallel accounts in Matthew and Luke, the two fellows who were demon-possessed and living out in the tombs. And apparently, Mark only mentions one because apparently he kind of took the lead in, in this. He was maybe the more prominent of the two. But he couldn't be bound with chains. He would simply break the chains. They lived among the tombs. Jesus comes into that area and approaches them. Nobody else wanted to approach him because they'd been bound and couldn't be contained and they were dangerous. And Jesus takes control of the situation and he says, what's your name? And the guy says, Legion, because we're many. And Jesus casts them out and they go into a, a herd of pigs that were nearby and with whatever panic pigs are capable of, they just simply ran to the edge of a, of a cliff there and were drowned in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus constantly was dealing with very real, evil, spiritual beings. And here is another case in point. This young boy was demon-possessed. His dad had no doubt heard about Jesus in his ministry. I don't know how old exactly the boy was, but he was certainly old enough to be able to get around and function on his own. Probably early to middle childhood somewhere. We don't know how far this father traveled, bringing his son with him. But he must have traveled a little distance. I don't think that he was like living right in the area. He came and he found first the disciples. People must have known where they were staying. And the guy shows up there in the valley at their, their little area where they were staying and, and didn't realize that Jesus wasn't among them at first. Jesus and his three disciples are coming down the mountain and haven't arrived when this man shows up with his son. And apparently there were some scribes that had arrived as well. Now Jesus is up in Gentile territory, that's true. But the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the enemies of Jesus were always on the watch trying to find something where they could accuse him, some way of tripping him up, some way of discrediting him among the people. And so they seem to always be there. Sometimes they're face to face with Jesus. Sometimes they're off in the shadows, just kind of watching, looking, hoping for an opportunity. You know how people are, don't you? They, they kind of lie in the background a little bit and they wait for their opportunity. And I think that's what the scribes were doing here. They may have been shadowing Jesus for a day or two. And now they see an opportunity. Perhaps it was Jesus' absence from the group that emboldened them to pick a fight, to have an argument about something. Maybe it was their failed attempts at casting out this demon that emboldened these scribes to step forward and engage these nine disciples, these nine followers of Jesus in some kind of, of altercation there. I'm not sure all of the circumstances, but the scribes are there, and they are not there for a good purpose. You know, sometimes we run into folks like that today, don't we? They, they show up at a worship service, they come for some purpose other than genuine worship. They come seeking to find fault. They come to spread their skepticism. They come to try to infiltrate the body of Christ with false doctrine or something. They're there. They might look religious, 
but they have an agenda that is far from the truth. Beware, because the, the scribes and the Pharisees are still active in the world today. Now if you look at the situation here, it's just astounding what's going on. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, it says that these seizures, some translations say that he was epileptic. Uh, I, I think they probably make that uh, translation because of the behavior that he, he foams at the mouth and he dashes himself into the fire or into the water and becomes rigid. And, and some, of the, some of the symptoms there look like what we would identify today as modern epilepsy. But I don't think that we can equate the two. Because this boy, and, and Jesus understands it clearly, was responding in his own physical body to the actions of the demon that had possessed him. And so while on the surface there may be some characteristics that we would associate with epilepsy, I think there's a lot more to what's going on here. And Jesus understood that. And I want us to think about something here. I, I try to emphasize it on Wednesday nights during our Bible study. Don't ever be misled by the similarities of things. Okay? Truth is not discerned in the similarities of things. Because Satan is smart. He didn't just you know, show up last week. He's, he's been around since the creation of the world. He was created as a righteous angel to start with. And because of wickedness within himself, he fell. But he's been around a long time. He's observed humanity for the last 6,000 or so years. He knows things. He's pretty smart. And so in, in mimicking these kinds of experiences, he subtly disguises what's really going on. Don't be fooled by similarities because Satan loves to trade on things that are similar in order to get you off of the truth. Most religions of the world will say something like, do good to your neighbor. That doesn't make all religions valid. Just because Jesus said, treat others the way you want to be treated yourself, that doesn't mean that when other religions sort of echo that thought, that it means that they're all the same. Look at the differences. And that is where you will discover the truth. It's in the differences. Jesus sees this boy, and he asks the father, how long has it been this way? And the father says, since his youth, the word there really is infancy, since really he was born, this has been happening. And perhaps even with increased frequency, which is maybe why one of the motivations why the father is seeking help. The father loves his son. He has compassion on his son. His life was in danger, wasn't it? I mean, the boy, when, when these experiences would come upon him, he, he would try to throw himself into the fire or throw himself into the water. It's just tragic. And the father in his desperation, can you imagine the tension in that home? Can you imagine what was being said in their community, what the, the neighbors were thinking? This father is desperate for help. And so he comes to Jesus. He doesn't find Jesus right away, but he finds the disciples of Jesus. Now these are the same guys that had been empowered by Jesus earlier to cast out demons. Do you remember that in Mark chapter 6 when we were there? Let me just read part of it for us. Chapter 6, beginning at verse 7, it says, He called the twelve to himself and 
began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Now the next several verses give instructions on not taking a cloak and a staff and staying where you were and so forth. And then in verse 12 it says, So they went out and they preached that people should repent. Their mission was a preaching mission. And to authenticate their message that everybody needs to repent, Jesus gave them authority on that occasion to heal people and to cast out demons. And verse 13 says, They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So these nine guys had been empowered by Jesus earlier on that occasion to do exactly what the Father had come with His Son to ask be done. Get rid of this demon. And they couldn't do it. They failed. Boy, now that'll shock your faith for a little bit, won't it? I mean, this guy comes, he travels, however far it is that he travels, and he's looking for Jesus, and when he gets to the group, Jesus isn't there. Well, that was a disappointment. And when he asks the group that's there, can you help me? Can you cast this demon out? Whatever it was they did, failed. That's going to shake his faith a little bit. And then there's the scribes. Now the guy was smart enough to know that these scribes, though they were religious experts, had no power and authority. He doesn't even ask them for help. But the scribes are, are doubtless going, no, nah, no, nah, see, you can't do it. What's the matter with you? Remember, they're looking for some way to discredit this whole message that Jesus has been preaching. So now this poor father has that third blow, you know? Here's the critics. Here's the guys making fun of this whole thing. We can understand why the dad was a little bit discouraged, can't we? All of a sudden, though, Jesus and the other three disciples arrive on the scene. And again, Matthew says that the father ran, that he fell on his knees. You get the picture that this guy's desperate? He fell on his knees. And he pleads with Jesus. Notice with me in Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 18. He's describing this. He says, whenever it, that's the demon, seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? I think he's directing that at his disciples. They've been with him now three plus years. He's in the last six months of his ministry. He's, he's moving toward Jerusalem. And, and, and he's headed there and will arrive at the time of Passover. And he's going to be crucified and he's going to be raised from the dead. This is the focal point of Jesus' ministry. And so for the last three plus years, he's been teaching these guys leading up to this very event. And they're not getting it. And I think Jesus, because He is fully human, as well as fully God, is just a little bit exasperated. We understand that. How many times has it been in your life, maybe in, in raising children, maybe in teaching somebody a job at work, maybe in, in whatever, but you've been in the, ex, in the position of teaching someone and they're just not getting it and it's like i don't know how else to explain this to you you know we, we've all been there maybe we've been on the receiving end of that you know and some poor teacher has been trying to tell me something and i'm going huh i just don't get it 
We've all been there. And I think Jesus is just a little exasperated with these disciples because they've experienced it. They've, they've been there. They've heard. They've seen the miracles. They've seen his, heard His teaching. He's spent time with them. And, and they're not perfect yet. You know, I take just a small comfort in that because Jesus, though He is not exceptionally pleased with them, He doesn't cast them aside, does He? Jesus takes the matter in hand. You know, there are times in our lives when we, we get to the end of our faith. We are often of little faith, aren't we? And, and Jesus wants our faith to grow and I think has brought this situation about so that He can maybe help to teach them more about faith and then put them in a position where their faith will grow and where they will be chided a little bit for maybe their complacency in dealing with this situation. Jesus takes time out of His busy schedule. He's got to be in Jerusalem. He's got to be there for the Passover. He's got to be there to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And yet, He takes the time for this desperate father and this desperate situation and these thick-headed disciples who just haven't quite gotten it yet, He takes the time once again to teach. To display the power of God. To, to press it home into the minds of people who He is and what He has come to do. What does that tell us about God? That God is patient? That God is gracious? That God is merciful? That God is... The fancy word is long-suffering. He puts up with us. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that because it gives me hope. In fact, it encourages me to get out of my complacency and to pursue the Lord with greater passion. It, it, it brings conviction, you know? It brings conviction. I don't know where these nine guys were, or eight of them. Now Judas, we understand, he's part of this nine. Judas is a traitor. Judas is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Judas was never a genuine believer. Judas was the black sheep. He was the one who was the tool of Satan who would bring about the the betrayal of Jesus Christ. All of that was according to God's plan and purpose. I get that. But, but Judas made a whole string of bad choices along his life. And he was sold out to the devil. A wolf in sheep's clothing. But the other eight who were there, remember three were with Jesus, the other eight were genuine disciples, genuine believers. And maybe somewhere along the line they got a little complacent with their spiritual maturity. Does that ever happen to us? You know, we go along and, and we've seen some victories in the past. God has worked some great things in our lives. And we can look back and we can pull, oh yeah, God did this and that. And boy, here was a mountaintop experience there. And oh yes, I see all those things back there in my past. I'm, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape, you know. I mean, as far as Christians go, really, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of up there a little bit. And so we, we slack off in our prayer. We begin to go about our day and we forget that we need to spend time with our Heavenly Father. And, and, and the book maybe doesn't get opened every day. Maybe we let two or three days go by and then when we open it up, we just find our favorite verse and remind ourselves of it. And then we close it for another two or three days. And all the time, we're thinking, you know, ah, yeah, things are pretty good for me spiritually. I'm pretty strong. I, I, you know, I'm walking close to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, something happens. 
Maybe it's somebody at work that asks us a spiritual question. They, they, maybe it's somebody we've been praying for, and all of a sudden, you know, they ask us this question, and the door is open, and we find ourselves going, blah, and we don't know what to say, and we fall on our face because we haven't been with the Lord on a regular basis. We've gotten complacent. And, I, and, and maybe that's what's happening here. And maybe that's why Jesus says, ah, you faithless generation, how long am I going to have to put up with you? When are you going to start taking this thing seriously? Bring him to me. And so they brought him to Jesus. And when he, that's the boy, and the demon in the boy saw him immediately the spirit convulsed him and fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth here he is there in front of Jesus going through all these gyrations and Jesus is asking how long this has happened he's he's demonstrating his compassion he wants the dad to tell the whole story and he does he says, from childhood. And he's often thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. And then he says this, but if. If you can do anything, help us. <laughs> I like Jesus' response. Verse 23 says, if you can believe, all things are possible. Matthew and Luke kind of record Jesus' surprised response. He says, if? If I can do anything? And the implication is, of course I can do something. Isn't that why you came? Because I alone am able to handle this? Jesus says, if you believe, all things are... Boy, I love, I love this Father. He is so transparent. He is so open. He is so much like you and me. He cries out and says with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You've been there, haven't you? Something has happened in your life and it has just sort of knocked you flat because none of us are perfect in growing our relationship with Christ. All of us, every single one of us, your pastor probably leading the way, has times where, you know, spiritually we're strong and then other times we get distracted and we become embroiled in the busyness of life and, and the book lays unread and the prayer goes unprayed and and we just get absorbed in it, and then something comes along to jolt us back to reality. And yeah, we believe, but we are inconsistent. We don't believe as strongly as we should. And here's this fellow who admits the experience that every single believer in this room has. He says, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. And Jesus does. Jesus doesn't leave this poor man and his son just wondering what's next and, and, and groping in the darkness. No, Jesus administers genuine help and hope. He is a compassionate Savior. He takes time the father must have seen Jesus. Maybe, and I kind of picture it this way in my mind. Here, here's the crowd, and here's the dad and the boy, and, and they're facing one direction, and the crowd maybe is circled around, and they're all concentrating on what's happening. And, and now they're arguing. These scribes and the disciples are arguing back and forth. And they're occupied. They're not paying attention to what's going on. But the dad sees Jesus and the other three disciples coming, and so the dad, realizing that nothing's going to happen here, gets a hold of his son, 
comes out through the crowd and goes to where Jesus is. And then, in the midst of all of this hubbub and hullabaloo that's going on here, suddenly the disciples, the scribes, the, the people that are there, I don't know, but they realize, hey, the guy's gone. The boy's gone. Oh, look! Over there. And so here comes the crowd. And that's why Mark says there, immediately the father of child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together. Oh. So Jesus doesn't even get to the crowd yet. The dad sees him. The dad goes that direction. The crowd eventually follows. And Jesus, realizing that the crowd is about to show up, says, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead. And now the crowd shows up. And what do they see? What do they hear? They hear this demon shrieking out from this boy and convulsing him one final time. By the way, demons always have to obey God. Always. They may do it unwillingly, but they always obey. Always. God had spoken. Jesus, God, had spoken and cast that demon out, and there was no option. That demon had to leave. But here comes the crowd, and they, they saw it, and, and, and they heard it, and now this boy is lying there completely out of it, not moving a muscle, and the crowd says, oh, He's dead! But what does Jesus do? Absolutely in control of the whole situation. Verse 28, 7. Jesus took Him by the hand and lifted Him up, and He arose. Jesus took Him by the hand and, and is lifting Him and the boy is getting up himself. Because he's been delivered from this demonic possession that has been his only experience since childhood, since, since he was just a young, young boy. Verse 28 says this. <laughs> it, it, it's just amazing. Mark doesn't record what the, God, what the Father must have said. And maybe it's because the Father didn't say anything. Have you ever had an experience like that that it's just so deep and so large and so profound that there's hardly words to say? But I can guarantee you this, that Father's heart was glorifying God. Because only God could do what Jesus had just done. He was glorifying Jesus. In his heart, in his mind, in his whole being, he was thankful to God for having delivered his son. I wish we knew what happened to the rest of the story. We'll find out someday in glory. I think that, that the rest of the story will probably be told. Because it brings glory to God. The disciples, however, have to be embarrassed. They have to be. And so later, in verse 28, it says, And when he had come into the house, oh, they're not out in the valley anymore. They've come down off the mountain. They've, they've come now to a, a place, a house, where they were going to stay. And his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, a lot of the ancient manuscripts don't have the word fasting in there, but I'm going to assume that it was original. However, Jesus didn't have time to fast at that moment, did he? I mean, he comes down off the mountain, and right, he doesn't say, oh, wait a minute, hold on. 
we need, uh, let's see, a 24-hour fast ought to take care of this. So we're going to pray now and we're going to fast and uh, tomorrow I'll take care of the problem. That's not what Jesus does, is it? No. What Jesus is talking about is just our constant, continual spiritual preparedness. To be constantly, continually, spiritually prepared for whatever comes in life. That's, that's an everyday thing. Beloved, if your sum total experience of spiritual preparation is this hour on a Sunday morning, you are starving yourself to death. You can't get it all here. You, you wouldn't stand for me to preach it all. <laughs> you know, and I couldn't do it. It is the daily time in the Word of God, feasting on His Word. It is the daily time in prayer. And, and fasting was something that was observed, particularly in the Old Testament, when it would take like a day to prepare a meal. Most recipes started out, kill a chicken or kill a cow or something you know that's because there was no refrigeration they, they they had to start at the very beginning you know go out and get the vegetables whatever F feeding people was a day-long process most folks in the ancient world didn't have three meals a day they had a meal and to set that aside to spend time in prayer was the fast. You didn't eat today because you were busy praying. You were focusing your attention on... How many of us focus our attention on prayer with that kind of intensity? Probably very few, if any. Most of our prayers are at mealtime, aren't they? God, thank you for this food. You're thinking about that already, I know. Thank you for this food. Um, God, give us what we need today. Uh, God, I have this problem. Fix it for me. That's where so many of our prayers end up. But to pray for a brother or sister in Christ that's going through a hardship, to pray for a brother or sister in Christ whose life looks like it's all together and perfect, because we never know, do we? I mean, there might be some tragedy just around the corner for that dear brother and sister, and your intercessory prayer may be the very thing that God uses to carry them through a hard time. Jesus is talking here about that constant spiritual preparation that all of us need to have if we're going to have any victories in our spiritual life. Now, don't misunderstand. God doesn't expect, He knows better, that we're not going to be perfect at it. He knows that. But He also knows that we have a responsibility to be growing spiritually for ourselves. That was the problem, I think, for those eight disciples. Judas accepted, because he's, he's lost that was the problem. I don't think they had been, even though they were so close to Jesus, I don't think they had been paying attention to their own spiritual growth. And so Jesus says to them, how long am I going to put up with you? Guys, we've been at this over three years and I've got such little time left. When is it going to sink in? And I'm just as guilty as anybody. So some things for us to take home. Things to think about this coming week. First of all, notice the compassion of Jesus. Yeah, He's on the most critical mission that ever existed in the universe. That of offering Himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But that critical mission did not prevent Him from exercising compassion and mercy and grace toward this Father and this demon-possessed Son. Beloved, God is running the universe, but you know what? That doesn't mean that He's too busy for you. 
whatever your issue is, you bring it to the Lord. And you will find grace and mercy and help in time of need. We have a compassionate high priest who understands our situation and who is ready and willing and more than capable of helping us in our time of need. Secondly, I want you to think about the sovereignty of Jesus. He's in control of this whole thing. From the dad's perspective, I'm sure he thought it was all out of control. From the disciples who failed to cast out the demon, they were probably scratching their head going, man, what has gone wrong? Why, why it, it, This thing is out of control. For the people around, they thought the boy was dead. They, they didn't know what was going on. It just seemed like everything was, was flying apart. But it wasn't. Because Jesus was there. And Jesus was in control. And Jesus worked it out for the glory of God and for the good of those involved. And then finally, I want us to realize that we're in a constant battle. A constant spiritual battle. And in fact, we're behind enemy lines. And no soldier that is behind enemy lines ever lets their guard down for a second. We need to be soldiers behind enemy lines, keeping our nose in the book, keeping our hearts in communication with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. It is just full of good stuff. Stuff that we need. Father, it is the Word of life. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we will hear what Your Spirit has to say to us. And that for those who have been struggling and feeling desperate, Father, I pray that they will find hope and strength in the experience of this desperate dad. Father, for those of us who can easily become complacent in our walk with You, We've walked with You for many years and, and we can look back and see some tremendous victories and tremendous blessings and wonderful things and we rejoice in all of that. Father, don't let it dull our senses to the immediacy of the moment that we are still soldiers behind enemy lines and we need to be on our guard because Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Father, help us to stay close to you always. And Lord, when we stumble, when we struggle, help our unbelief. Pick us up. Draw us to yourself. Strengthen our faith. Strengthen our commitment to you. Because, Father, we want to hear You say, well done, good and faithful servant, on the day we stand before You. And to do that, Lord, we need Your help. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for Your compassion. Thank You for Your sovereignty. Thank You for Your love. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.